like to welcome all of you who came out on this illustrious evening. Um, my name is Bob Jacobson. I'm the director of Los Angeles Family, the center director, and we're kind of put this together for tonight. And this is the second time we've done this. Last summer we had Pastor Peter and Venerable Ravina um, talking about world peace, and so we kind of kicked it up a notch and asked them both to participate again, so we're really, really happy. Um, our speakers are Pastor Peter Schobert from University Congregation and Church, uh, world-renowned writer, speaker, and <laughs> <laughs> The really small world. And, and uh, visiting Los Angeles Champagne is Venerable Robina Curtin, who's been coming to our center here in Missoula for many years to teach and share the, the teachings of the Buddha with us. And we're very pleased to have both of them here tonight to talk about faith and the quest for social justice. And I'll let them be part of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You have to go first. Okay. Um, it strikes me that just being here sitting next to Ravina, talking about what we're talking about is an act of social justice. Because we live in a world of such deep distrust between uh, different traditions um, that just by sitting here together and by all of us joining together here, um, this is an act of solidarity with a vision that goes beyond us. And these kinds of gatherings um, sadly don't happen enough. Um, so tonight we are about um, uh, 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 a vision of peace um, by sitting here and talking and getting to know each other we are um, embodying social justice. I, uh, I laughed before I came over here um, I was at my church and we had a meeting and then upstairs there was a gathering going on every month for, I don't know, 15 years I think we've hosted um, a dinner every month for uh, HIV positive folks, their family and friends. It's just something that some of the folks in the congregation do. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you should come to the dinner tonight. I said, oh, I'd love to, but I, you know, I, I'm going to go speak on social justice. And I kind of paused and I said, I'm going to be using words, but you folks are in fleshing that. But we're kind of in fleshing this too because we brought our bodies here on a night that's cold and um, this isn't something that um, our world uh, gets its, its head around and its heart around enough. So I want to thank you for, for coming out um, and I want to thank you for sitting next to me. Well, thank you, Peter. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> So talk now. No, it wasn't enough. You have to say more. <laughs> say some more. Come on. Well, one of the thoughts, you know, I've been reflecting a little bit about um, this evening, and, and you know, you kind of, you go into your own story a little bit um, of how you find yourself speaking about social justice and how your journey of faith had something to do with that. And one of the realizations um, that I had, and I don't know that I thought about it this way before, but I realized that um, I didn't so much come to um, Christianity um, and then find a way with social justice. In, in my life, it was more that I knew deep down that social justice was an important part of my life, and that's what led me into my faith. You know, that oftentimes, it might work differently for different people, but you know, I'm 57 now, um, and as a young person um, involved in anti-war stuff and civil rights things and that sort of activity, um, you know, I knew in my heart, I knew in my guts that that what Dr. King was talking about was transforming my life, um, and that what Gandhi had taught changed my life and um, coming at those issues um, not as social justice as something that's on the outside but rather that's organically integrated into these traditions of faith that that we both are a part of um, it's a powerful experience for me to claim that story um, I know that um, 
the, the teachings of Dr. King changed my life. I know that my pastor, when I was in, in junior high, was a CO in World War II. That changed my life. Mm. Well, probably I thought, at the time, I think when I was a bit of an old radical lefty, I probably thought that Dr. King was a bit of a wimp. But um, I can probably appreciate him better now. Because I tended to think then that being angry and shouting and yelling and making as much trouble as possible, and I fantasise about revolution and all that, I think, at the time. But what I suppose I've learned since being a Buddhist about you know so-called social justice. Well, first of all, many people think that when you're a Buddhist, you're just watching your navel all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and you're uh, becoming a nice person and then giving up the world. And in a way, that's only that of course it's only part of it. But the real they, they have this nice analogy. I'm sure we talked about this before. That a bird needs two wings. Buddha says, and one is wisdom, which is where you do all the work on yourself to put yourself together, and then the other one is the compassion wing. And my feeling is that's that's the political wing. That's the social justice wing. That's what you put your money where your mouth is, you know. And so. Um, my biggest learning in this, working as a Buddhist, but in particular working with people in prison, is learning about how to um, change the world but not be angry, change the world but not blame. Because, and I know when I was an old lefty, a radical lefty, I, you just completely feast on blaming. You've got to have someone to blame. You've got to be someone, you've got to be angry with somebody. And even in fact at the time, I couldn't even imagine doing what I was doing in a way without being angry, which is why I probably thought Dr. Wim was a, Dr. King was a bit of a wimp or Gandhi was a bit of a wimp, you know. But what I've learned as a Buddhist, since being a Buddhist, that somehow you can, um, you can be strong and really stand up for something, and you don't have it, but not without. But you can do it without being angry, and I think that's a really big learning. Because I think one time the Dalai Lama was asked by some journalist, he said, "Well, anger looks good, you know. It seems to give you the energy to do things." And that Dalai Lama said, "I know what you mean, but he said, when it's only angry, it doesn't last. But when it's coming from compassion, it, you never give up." And then I even remember one time hearing, actually, recently about Dr. King. He said something like, "It's okay to be angry, meaning it's okay to find fault, but instead of just..." And I'm now going on to about, instead of jumping up and down and yelling about it, you then say, what can I do to help? And I think that's the key to it. That's really the aspect of what, what compassion is. You see something wrong, and then you have enough courage to say, it, to realise it's wrong. You've got to know it's wrong, but not, not to be angry, but to then say, what can I do to change? And then I think everything comes from this, you know. And I can see that certainly working with people in prison. I mean, there's every, every reason to be critical of American prisons, for example. I mean, I've heard recently, well, a couple of years ago, working, reading The Economist, that a quarter, no, the United States has 5% of the world population, but it has something like 25% of the prison population, yeah. which is a bit of a sobering kind of number, you know. And it's very easy for me, all those years I was working with people in prison for 14, 15 years, it was to be so easy to be angry, so easy to get very kind of arrogant and angry and pointing fingers and shouting and yelling. But it was so clear to me that would have exhausted me. It wouldn't have, it couldn't have sustained me and, I wouldn't, and nobody would have listened, mm -hmm. you know. So the thing is to be able to see what's wrong and then to find a solution, to do something. But I think the other thing I've really learned, because the world is so terrible, because there are so many, so many bad things happening in the world, you can say so much injustice, that no matter how much you do, it doesn't seem it's changing, you know. Sometimes you can be very depressed about it. But my feeling is that when there's not much anger, but when there's more perseverance and when there's compassion, then you do it. Every tiny little thing that you can do, you be happy with that, you know. One step at a time, one small thing affecting one human being. That, I think, is something really powerful. I know when I was, an old, again, an old radical lefty, it was all very big kind of broad strokes, dramatic changing the world ideas and demonstrations and big placards and things. But then, I, and I, at the, at was in, actually it was in the 70s, and a lot of the work I was doing, interestingly, was also with people in prison. It was at the time of the Black Panthers, you know, supporting all that movement. And then I remember 30 years later coming to the States plus, more than that, first, and starting to work with the same prisons, the same people that I used to think about and talk about back 30 years ago when it was all to do with the Black Panthers, I, it was a completely different whole thing. It was, it was the, where there's much more patience and dealing with people one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't this broad stroke trying to change the system. It was helping human beings change one step at a time, you know. So I think that can, even though it may be looking invisible, there's no, there's no stories written about it, but if you know you're helping one human being and that human being can help another human being and, and then it can spread this way. That was something I learned from it. So just to do it with courage, never give up, but to do it one step at a time. And, and to do it with a strong measure of humility. It's got to be, otherwise you go crazy. It's true, isn't yeah. it? Got to be strong, but humbled. Yeah. Humble doesn't mean weak. I think that's the point, isn't it? And to do it with um, a good measure of joy, too. I remember um, in 
my primary um, theology professor in seminary was actually a pretty well-known theologian. His name was Robert McAfee Brown, uh-huh. quite a peace activist mm-hmm. and whatnot, uh, and became a real um, well-known North American proponent of what's oftentimes called liberation theology, which emerged from um, the South, from the underside, from the poor. Um, but he would he would oftentimes say, if you're going to do the work of, of peace and social justice, and if you can't do it with a measure of joy, it would be much better for you and the world if you didn't do it. Yeah. I think it's true. I think it's very true. It's like that two wing mm. analogy. Um, That's fine. If we don't have, if it's all just about outward um, activism, and if there's no inward compassion or love, mm. or whatever words we might use, mm. um, that's a broken winged bird that's unable to fly. It's true. Langston Hughes mm. once said. No, oh, it's true. And we do forget that in the social mm. justice community, and mm. I find this to be a very hopeful time because I think we're in a time of reclamation. You know, it's not just about going out there and doing things mm-hmm. as actively and sadly as violently as that can be too. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a time where I think people are understanding, oh, there's more to this, you know. Mm-hmm. Now that we're, you know, 70 years out from Gandhi and 50 years out from King, you know, maybe it takes us that long to understand that the nonviolent embrace of our enemy isn't just something you hear about once and agree to. That's a lifelong pilgrimage that we all are called to make. Mm -hmm. And um, we never quite get there, but we are called to to join together and and journey in that way. And we can do that as Buddhists and as Christians, as people of whatever faith tradition or Mm -hmm. non-tradition. And and, uh, and I think people are starting to get that. The social justice isn't only um, oppositional. That true social justice is, is, is broader and deeper than that. Um, you know, Jewish folks talk about the cult of um, shalom. You know, and it's oftentimes you know, talked about as being the presence of justice with compassion and with love. It's very broad. It's not just about, you know, storming the Bastille and throwing the bastards out. Um, it's, it's more than that. It's the nonviolent embrace of our enemies. Um, you know, which is, uh, you know, I always think when it comes to issues of faith that our, our, um, our reach needs to exceed our grasp. And mm-hmm. I'll never get to the point of being able to um, wholly uh, embrace nonviolently my enemy, but I always want to have that in front of me. That's a guiding principle that um, can invite me deeply into the cause of social justice, um, but it can allow me to do that hopefully with some sense of reverence and integrity as hard as it is, and I can't do that alone. I need a community of people around me to, to help me uh, in that way. So then, so w- what, what would you call, would you, what would you call the work of helping people? Helping others, helping sick, helping dying, helping your next door neighbor, is that not social justice too? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, I think that is social justice. Helping, I, yeah. you, know, I, I, you know, I think all of us gather here tonight as social justice. Those folks over at the church serving the uh, HIV folks, that's social justice. The, um, you know, the people who were on campus this weekend learning about uh, global warming and whatnot, the young people, that's social justice. And it is social justice when someone um, gets up off of their easy chair and goes across the railroad tracks and helps somebody. So, and what do you think it needs from the point of view of the person to want to do that? What do you think? The, what do you think? What do you think we need to do inside? What would prevent us from doing it? Um, I think we forget. You know, I don't know that anybody would say, "Oh God, no, you don't need to go serve people." You know. Are you sure? Well, I mean, you know, Dr. King said anybody can be great because anybody can serve. 
maybe there are folks who are, you know, philosophically opposed to compassion, but far fewer than I think there really are. Um, are you sure? Well, sure. Why do you think there's so much I mean, suffering? How can I prove that to you? <laughs> well, look at the world. Look at the, I mean, I don't want to be negative, but look, yeah. at the, look at the amount of wars and violence and murders and suffering and being junkies and alcoholics and stealing and you think... I, and I don't know that that's necessarily so much a character flaw as it is, you know, maybe that's where the social part of justice enters in. We have to work together to create a social context where people are reminded of who they are of how connected they are to each other. <coughs> what I meant was, aren't those people, wouldn't, I'm not trying to be horrible because we've all got negativity, but isn't, aren't, isn't that the result of not having whatever it needs in, that has to cause us to reach out and want to see others suffering and help them? When you're overwhelmed by your own suffering, isn't, isn't it? And I think the amnesia part is there too, yeah. you know? You just, you, you know, you, you do acts of, of callous disregard, um, you might do acts of overt violence to other people. Um, is that because that's just who they are or they're in a social context where that kind of stuff is, I mean, you've spent all this time in prison and, and the violence that goes on there. Um, and you know when you're with these folks that there's, you know, what the Quakers refer to as that inner light. You know, there's that light, but it gets blocked and it gets taken away, it gets ignored, it's forgotten, or you can't believe it's there. And, you know, so when, when any of us might help someone to claim their light, that's an act of social justice too. Mm -hmm. you know? um, yeah, I think that that double-winged bird um, you know, the inward journey and the outward journey. They have mm -hmm. to be in harmony with each other. Absolutely. And, um, and we easily forget that because we're such doers, you know. Mm -hmm. We're such human, mm -hmm. um, you know, doers instead of human beings. True. I like this. I brought a quote from uh, Thomas Merton. I thought this was really important. Um, he, he wrote, to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activism kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. It's to have a sense of, of priority of some form of order so that we're not just, you know, replicating a society that runs itself by busyness, <laughs> um, that justifies itself by how much it can do. Um, so coming, coming in and coming down, um, reclaiming, you know, that light, you know, even in the darkest of all places, in the middle of prisons, in the middle of of, uh, you know, massacres and wars mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, it, and isn't, isn't that maybe the, um, the core of what faith is, you know, of any of the world religions, you know? How can we make that light shine? And we've all got it. I think you're right. What are you people out there? Ask some questions or say something. <laughs> <laughs> John? I'm wondering, um, my wife and I attend Peter's church, so we're coming from that background. Mm. I'm wondering in Buddhism, I, I wonder if you could help us understand it in relation to how most Americans would understand Christianity, at least socially. Yeah. That you have uh, a whole evangelical fundamental kind of direction, two-sided, you know, on one end of Christianity where there's less focus on social justice and outward in some ways, and you have the peace and justice movements and Catholic and Eastern Protestantism, you know, oversimplifying here. Yeah. But it's kind of different. I wonder if, if Buddhism has as many varieties as we do of Christendom, mm -hmm. and if some of them are turned away from what 
would seem to many of us to be peace and justice concerns, or if all of Buddhism has that, but we just don't see huh. it. I mean, how is Buddhism like or different? Than uh, that's interesting. I know. Yeah, exactly. Let me think about. It. Um, well, first of all, is there's no, I think the numbers are much less, would they not be? Whether it's just in this country, but in the world. I think there are far less Buddhists than Christians. And in some countries, okay, there's two main tracks of Buddhism. And there's some Buddhism, for example, that's practiced in Thailand and Burma, where mainly the emphasis is when you become a monk, you go up to the mountains. That, it's like it's, you, go, you go into the, that, that mode. And you don't often, occasionally there are some of them who um, would then be involved in the world, but not often. And, that's, and they're, they're the most visible ones. And then you've got the Buddhism of, say, for example, Tibet, where they talk about the bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. In Tibet, when it was before the communists took over, 90%, 95% of the country were Buddhist and you know, one, a sixth of the population were in the monasteries. And the emphasis there was on the, the monastic life. But still, there was an enor it was just naturally part of their world that was um, action and compassion. It was just the way it was, you know. And I'd say, Buddhism in the West, for example, in this country, in Australia, in Europe, where I'm traveling around all the time now, there's, there's an enormous amount, amount of emphasis on uh, action. A among most, even all uh, the Zen Buddhists, the, all the different groups of Buddhism, the groupings of Buddhism in the West, and I think there's a, across the board an, um, a, a, a wish to make it action, Str a strong emphasis on, on action being, um, being a part of it. And there's not as much extreme, I think. I don't know too many fundamentalist Buddhists. They must be around. I'm sure they're around, but I don't know too many of them. You know, so there's not the same extremes. I think, in my experience, nothing like actually. Actually, and that reminded me. I mean, one conference I spent the day involved in in D.C. a couple of years ago was uh, put together by I can't think of the group now. I think it was a group of Christians who were so fed up with the fundamentalists taking all the getting all the getting all the limelight that it was people who are involved in social social activism. It was just a half a day, and it was wonderful to see. You know, there were the Muslims and the Buddhists and the and all across the board, lots and lots of wonderful Christians all doing their own little thing with prisons, with this, with that, with racism, with poverty, with AIDS. It was very encouraging to see it. It was very nice actually. Yeah, I think if you. <coughs> I didn't do it, but if you were to Google social justice and church, you'd probably get more hits about what Glenn Beck said than anything else. You know, Glenn Beck is a very right-wing social commentator who a year or two ago said, if your church is talking about social justice, run away. You know, because that this was just anathema. This is... Because you're trying to make him more communist or something. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, and, it, and it's that notion, I think, for a lot of people in contemporary America mm -hmm. who align with whatever flavor of fundamentalism that they might um, connect with, that marriage between social justice and theology is anathema. They can't allow for it, because if you allow for that, their system would, would tend to disintegrate. So what's their position then? Well, I think that it's that notion that, you know, it, it, it would emphasize a very individualistic uh, religious path that um, is married in ways between, um, uh, you know, with, with capitalism, that it is a, a, a sort of a secular faith that has a very, very heightened pietistic um, veneer, but within that, um, there's a huge embrace with, um, you know, c consumer based militarism. So and you mean the people who are members of those churches don't help people? Is that what you're basically saying? No, I don't I'm think that they, that. no, I'm not saying that. So they that wouldn't call all. it social justice then? But you wouldn't, you wouldn't use that word, oh, I see. those okay. words. Yeah, because justice implies oh, okay. some degree of, at least in a Judeo-Christian tradition, uh -huh some form of allegiance to what the, the uh, prophetic uh, message, the, the prophets of the Old Testament were talking about in terms of economic justice, justice for the stranger, oh, justice for the widow, mm -hmm. justice for all the marginalized people. And when you're tied into um, uh, sort of a capitalist militarism, social justice is not good news. Oh, you have to exclude that from your lexicon, mm -hmm. and you have to demonize it as being something bad. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, in my in my particular tradition, the denomination I'm part of is the United Church of Christ, um, which was the denomination that Obama was a part of before the whole flap with Jeremiah Wright. Remember that during uh, the election? Um, Jeremiah Wright uh, was brought up in that tradition of the black liberation theology. Right. He uses that language, which it was very easy for mainstream media and, and uh, right-wing religion to demonize. Of course it was. And so you, uh, you know, I met Jeremiah Wright, he's a great guy, and the work he did at his church in Chicago was nothing short of, you know, amazing. But, you know, you demonize it. He's like, oh, he's a radical. You know, he hates America. And uh, so, you know, when we gather and talk overtly about social justice and our traditions of faith, we have to know that even by doing that, we're doing something uh, a little bit countercultural and subversive mm -hmm. in a lot of people's minds, which is incredible considering a generation ago this wouldn't have been thought of as yeah, being. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? That that opened up a lot, Peter. I think is what you're saying there. And just kind of when you look at our history in terms of King, where he you know started, and, and he was uh, obviously doing social justice, and it started as a fractional piece, and then it, but it really caught on, and it became universal enough, so it it really changed some things. And when you Currently, I mean, where we are today, in a way, is, is so much more dispersed. And it's um, when you kind of follow the money, you know, in terms of um, where the social justice piece is sort of fixing pieces that are broken. Um, and what King was able to do is to, there was a wave that brought tremendous support from everyone together to have change. And it's, it's um, how do you put those pieces together where you have enough um, awareness or the, the Glenn Becks and the, and the right wing fundamentalist doesn't become so divisive? You know, how, do you, how do you do more than pick up the pieces with social justice that have been broken? You know, what, what, is, the, what is the work at this point to, to reach higher? You know, what, what ignites all that to to, um, to bring in resource, because it does come back to capitalism, how we spend our money, the military, the whole, the priorities, that we've created a world picture that is interconnected, and yet it's violent and deadly, and, and it's gonna bring us all into uh, oblivion. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to have social justice on a personal level, but then how do you, how do you, um, where are we going? In both of your senses, how do we? Where do, where do we move to from here? I don't. I can't even begin to answer like that anymore. And when I was a political activist, I could, but somehow now I just don't know how to say it. I wouldn't even know what to begin with. I just think, for me at the moment, I just think all I can do is whatever I can do in the field that I'm doing it, with the most positive mind possible. And every single person I affect, hopefully, that'll you know, it's, it's a it's a trickle. A quiet underneath trickle effect. Sometimes it can look very dramatic. It's a reverse Republican. <laughs> Is it? Okay. <laughs> no, and then they have trickle down too. Oh, I see. Okay. So that's that's my that's my answer. I can't. I mean, I, I can't imagine. So if you have an effect on the world, that, that's that's just that's like an accidental. That's a bonus, I think. So you know, if I go but somewhere. I'm just looking at our history, and and maybe you need a personality like Martin Luther King. You know, the the, the social times were there. And it's, it feels like, in a way, we're starving. Obama did that in 2008. There was a, something of a, a groundswell of change. And then it's like, well, we, we, we changed a little. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, we're, not, we're still looking. Um, and it's wonderful to have the, the, the different traditions in our lives, you know, the, the spiritual paths that are available. And the joining of those paths, to see the two of you together is really a nice, beautiful, important thing. Because mm -hmm. um, we need, I feel, I mean, that there's more that wants to happen that way. Well, you know, I think one of the issues you bring up, which is so important, is that we live um, with remarkable division. And 
we, we live in a context where we're encouraged to, um, you know, sort of live within our own little tribal enclaves and uh, to lift up our own particular special interests. And where is the unifying whole? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's, that's an enormous social issue today, and I think it's actually an enormous individual one, you know. Uh, we don't live um, lives that feel very united. We live divided lives. There's an enormous gap, as Parker Palmer says, there's an enormous gap between our souls and our roles. How do we bring our soul into our roles? And, you know, that might be roles as being a social justice activist or a peacemaker, whatever. But you know, and I guess I'm cynical enough to think that this, you know, the system, whatever it is, it has a vested interest in keeping us pretty divided. That's the way a good consumer militaristic culture can work. And, um, and we have to be a people of resistance, not violently, but a people of resistance saying, I am going to be vested in community. I am going to be a person of compassion. I am going to live out an alternative lifestyle. Um, and the world is deeply in need of that, and not necessarily for the results. You know, you do it because that's what that light is shining to but us. But I think that's about. the individual one, though. You don't try and do it as a demonstration, you just do it. You just do it, yeah, and that might be a collective thing, that might be yeah. part of a movement, that might be whatever. Or it might not, and it doesn't matter. I walk around the world with one bag and one set of robes. Does that count? Am I? And I go to eight countries in in one year and fifty Buddhist centres. So I don't have a community. Yeah. I'm an old gypsy. So do I count? Do I? Do my example of what you're? Saying? I don't have a community. Well, you uh, are a, a, a nomad. I'm a nomad. Yes. Yeah. With one bag. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus said something about that too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably he had less than a bag. Probably Buddha had less, they both carried around less than one bag, I think. Yeah, I think one of the maybe one of the differences between social justice in a Buddhist context and social justice in a Christian context. Christianity largely comes from the West. Or its largest expressions are that way. And we manifest social justice along those ways. We tend to divide things up into right and wrong, a lot of dualistic thinking, um, and can use a great deal of oppositional language and approaches. You know, it's right against wrong, it's da 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 da. Whereas Buddhists might use less oppositional language and talk more in a more unitive context, <coughs> which can seem to, I think, a lot of Westerners that all you're doing is, you know, contemplating your navel. Uh -huh. but, yeah, maybe, it, but among, maybe Western Buddhists is no different. Most Western Buddhists come back from, come from the Jewish and, the, you know, the Christian background. And then you have things like, of course, the, the issue of Tibet, which is a big one for a lot of sure. Tibetan Buddhists. Yeah. That's straightforward right and wrong, you know, mm -hmm. isn't it? And that includes all the typical tools like demonstrations and, you know, it's exactly the same. But I, I find it quite hopeful now in terms of social justice issues from a Western context and, and, and I think within what I probably know the best, a, a progressive Christian context, that I'm, I'm seeing and hearing a lot less of the oppositional, which I think in many ways feels and looks like it's a transactional thing. You know, you, if we do this, we're going to have this happen. It's kind of tit for tat. And I'm, I'm much more gravitating towards um, not so much a transactional approach, but more of a transformational approach. That I know that I have to go through transformation if social justice is going to be real. I'm not just doing this on behalf of those, you know, poor folks over there or these African American folks over here or whatever. Those divisions don't really count. I, I need to experience a transformative um, uh, inward process in order to know that this 
work of justice and peace is real and good and true. It's not a hierarchical thing. It isn't just an activist-based thing. Uh, it's it's a lot more than that. It's there's a there's a very real spirituality of social justice, um, and it's humbling to be able to, you know, maybe be some small part of what that represents. I suppose you're just saying you've got to work on yourself. That's the wisdom wing and the compassion wing. You yeah. can't just go out there being arrogant and trying to change the world. You just got to, if you don't change yourself, you can't do It's like we talked last time about peace. You can't have external peace if you don't have internal. It's literally not possible. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. It's got to come from the inside, doesn't it? Well, it's, the, it, 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 it's that complementary side. You know, it, um, you know, you know, most of us have probably been involved in all forms of social justice uh, issues in the past, um, you know, take and we're all called to take inventory. You know, were those processes something that um, went beyond us? Did they create within us a deeper sense of peace, of 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 being connected to the whole of of life? Um, or was there, you know, was was it something of the soul, or was it something of the ego? And um, I think it's awfully uh, easy to get involved in in um, a lot of self-righteous stuff of the left as well as the right. And and uh, you know if we don't have our if we don't bring our soul into that whole thing if we don't have both both wings of that bird I you know I worry about where it's, where where it can go and can't go. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? Yeah, you know, I think what you were getting at earlier is that it's a lot more convenient for individuals to accept the lie than to work towards the truth. Mm. And with some of these new laws that were just passed in the United States, our constitution is like toilet paper. <laughs> and we can be branded as terrorists just for having this conversation. Yeah. What new laws are they? What are they? Oh, they, they can, without any kind of charges, they can take you, throw you in a prison cell, and have no due process, nothing. You can just, they can just throw away the keys. <coughs> I don't know what it means. Yeah. I forget what the law is. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I was sharing a, yeah. sharing a quote earlier to, tonight at a meeting from uh, Walter Brueggemann, who's a Old Testament theologian who really knows the the message of the prophets with justice, and he talks about um, how we live in a time when the powers that be um, uh, present us with a totalizing truth. I think it's such a great phrase that um, the powers that be say this is the way it has to be. And we, in traditions of faith that have within our traditions bold visions of, of, of peace and compassion and justice, we have to exist as those who are an alternative to those who would make totalizing truth. So we sit together out of these very different traditions that have wonderful places of connection, and we say, yeah, you know, I haven't cornered the market on truth. We have to talk to each other. We have to learn from each other. We have to, you know, I have to, to convert Ravina into being a better Buddhist, and she has to convert me into being a better Christian. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a lot harder for me than you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what else, people? <laughs> go. Uh, do you have any any experiences in from being in prison that um, would surprise us about what can happen in prison to people who? who are you mean in terms of uh, success of transformation? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, I, one thing. Absolutely. Um, well, first, it seems to me that people in prison are like the scum of the earth, aren't they? The bottom, the, the bottom rung, even even more than homeless people in some way, because somehow they're like they're criminals as well as poor and 
everything. So I, I, what I found was so surprising, we began about 15, 16 years ago when I first came to California and I was editing a Buddhist magazine and we got a letter from a young Mexican, American, from Los Angeles who'd been in the gangs, he told me, since he was 11. And uh, he was now with triple life sentence for being in the gangs, not for, not for murder, because the sentencing was quite severe. They're looking at things in California now, I think, because they've got to empty the prisons. They're quite overcrowded. But um, I remember he was the first person who ever wrote. And then as a result of his, we then started getting letters from prisoners. And I, I remember just the people who wrote to us. We would up, at some point when we had about nine full-time staff here in Australia, and um, we were getting like a thousand letters a month from people in prison. We had a, a team of a couple of hundred mentors in about 20 countries and a kind of whole system where we would not only visit them, but people having one-on-one -on -one communication, which was pretty incredible. But the thing that I saw was the, like 99% of the letters, you saw immediately they had no education. So they really were the bottom of society, you know, with the, the lousiest of lives and drugs and violence all their lives, never hearing a single kind word. Many of them even, um, I could tell, even didn't even know how to put full stops and commas. There was no, no literacy whatsoever. But so, somehow some eagerness in their hearts for some tools, you know. And so I, I remember I was just deeply inspired, and it's continued to be because uh, I still write to quite a few of our friends in prison. The unbelievable changes in these real garbage dumps of places to live, quite out, I mean, the, the, the noise, the violence is beyond bearing when, when I think of some of the environments, some of the prisons. And just the most extraordinary changes in people that the world would not even look at as being even remotely possible. And just, I was just really impressed all the time, really impressed. I mean, I can tell you some funny stories about people's ability to change. There's always one story. One of my friends, Richie, he was a Mexican gangster, ex-gangster, and he, um, a friend of the first guy who wrote, and he wrote to me for the first year and told me about his anger. And I went to meet him eventually, and he was in one of the top security prisons. It was between the glass, and I said, hello, Richie, how are you? And he had all covered in tattoos, which is very typical for the Mexican gangsters. Maybe in all the prisons, I'm not sure, but certainly in California. They've got their, it's their, oh, it's their prison art, they said. They make their own needles, they make their own ink, they make up their own typography, their gang names, covered in tattoos he was, I remember, all over his body. And I said, how's your anger, Richie? And he kind of blushed under his tattoos. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm sorry, Rabina, but I, I had a fight with my cellie this morning, his cellmate. He said, I put his head down the toilet. But then he said, but Rabina, I took it out again. <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember thinking, and he's probably murdered three people already on the streets. Mm -hmm. And I remember being very impressed. I mean, that's, that's transformation, isn't it? Maybe you wouldn't call that spiritual practice, but he didn't kill a fourth person. So I can tell you numberless stories like that, where it's just levels of kind of change, at, at the really that, that kind of intense level. Sincere human beings really want to work on their minds. And then really try and be, I mean, there they were, many of them on death row, many on death row, many with life sentences, never going to see the light of day. And that's the thing that really did strike me. We tend to think of helping people in prison so that when they get out of prison, they make the world a better place. But prison is the world, you know. Some of them will never leave prison. So as far as I was concerned, they were a part of society. Prison inclu is included in society. So to be able to help people in prison who could help each other in prison was unbelievably badly needed. And I could really see the benefit, again, of one-on-one -on -one each. I mean, one of my friends on death row in Kentucky, who's got his death date coming soon. They do their appeals, and it probably takes 30 years to go through the courts. And he said, I'm ready for that electric jolt. You know, and there may be 50 guys on death row in Kentucky in this one, one, uh, one, pre one prison. And they live in this environment together in their red jumpsuits. And, um, and you can just tell from his letters, he really has had a profound effect. His best friends are Catholic, he's, they're both friends of mine. And just the way they are by working on their own minds, helping each other, you know, is quite remarkable to see. And it's, and it's work you'd never see visible, you'd never ever hear about, you'd never read about it. So for me it was deeply inspiring and, and I realised the benefit of helping people one on one. It didn't have to be big broad stroke demonstrations and getting big news stories, you know. It was one human being at a time, helping them change their minds so they could help each other. So I found it very, very uh, inspiring. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, my husband just was uh, telling me today uh, about the news that in the last few days uh, there was a t uh, Tibetan monk that immolated himself. Yes, I was reading that. On himself. Yeah. And I, uh, it, it kind of impacted me uh, a lot, and that's why I actually we decided to come tonight and. Ask you what is the you know the symbolic meaning? What is the I really don't know. You know, I. 
it's not a typical Buddhist. It's not a typical Buddhist uh, response at all. I know the Dalai Lama is really sad and upset by it, but I think it's just the desperateness of the of the Tibetan monks. Absolutely desperate because they're not. They're not. They don't get listened to. They're treated appallingly. It's been going on for 50 years in Tibet now, and they, 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 there's no freedom at all. There's kind of. I just think it's they're being very desperate. It's not a typical Buddhist thing at all. It's quite surprising actually. I think they're just very very desperate, trying to get some publicity. But I can't explain it from a Buddhist point of view. It's not a typical Buddhist approach at all. It's just a desperate human beings, I think. I don't know what else to say. It makes me sad when I read it. That's, that's exactly what we were saying this afternoon. Exactly. Because they're like, I think that's what it is. I think that's what, for 50 years, the Tibetans in Tibet have been struggling and trying to get the freedom that they feel is their right, you know, but the communist, the, the, the communist government is just so ruthless and completely dominates, I mean, allows, supposedly allows um, the mo people to become monks and nuns in the monasteries, but with total control in the government, with, real, no, with no freedom really at all. It's becoming worse and worse in that way, you know, so it's very phony. They're right to have their religion is not really true and so I think it's just they're desperate I can't think of any other reason mm. when I hear the reports of it yeah you know when you were talking about the uh, context of a prison and with capital punishment and whatnot you know that's an interesting issue in Montana um, <coughs> presently the president of, of Montana Association of Churches and the one issue that we've decided in these last two legislative sessions to deal with uh, is the abolition of the death penalty. Okay. We've become unbelievably close uh -huh. to making that happen. There's a group called the Abolition Coalition. Um, and we really feel like we'll be able to do that next year. And, you know, Montana is a hang em high state. And uh, it, a lot of folks are saying, if we can do that in Montana, mm -hmm. that will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's a particularized issue that I think is, is a powerful one mm -hmm. for us to think about and then yet at the same time you have you know these precious monks lighting themselves on fire I know it's awful desperation. I know. It, is yeah. all, it has to be that there's no other thing I can think of you know desperate to get some visibility yeah, someone back there had yeah. a question oh. yeah. I was just thinking earlier on when you talked about how Tibet used to be uh -huh. and then since the communist regime of the Chinese came in how so many Tibetans had to leave, and how His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been asking and working for social justice for his people and also for the mm. world, mm. Um, being a pacifist and everything. Mm. So no, it's true. I think that's what transformation it's true. change for the Tibetan people. As a result of his work, you mean? Well, yes, but also mm. as a result of them having to leave Tibet. Oh, of course, and yes. For him to have to leave Tibet and yes. then to begin what he has been doing. Yes. It's so true. I mean, it's unbelievable. No, it's true. Absolutely. Say some more. Is that what you want? Unfortunately, sometimes he doesn't get listened to. But he has certainly have a big voice in the world. I mean, that's that's the advantage of having kind of famous people, isn't it? We all need, you, you need the Martin Luther Kings and the Dalai Lamas of the world because people like a very famous charismatic person I think it really does help I think it's fantastic to have that and maybe right now you know there isn't there aren't that many in certainly in the states maybe mm -hmm. but it's certainly true that Dalai Lama has got some it's got a, a people people of all I mean just recently um, Desmond Tutu was in because they were both fellow Nobel Prize winners he was in Dharamsala and I saw some news reports and they just adore each other and this incredible communication between them and it's just that is so nice to see people who both like but those two you know who are quite famous and it's really nice to see the communication. And it's, it's just marvelous to have someone like the Dalai Lama who's completely non-sectarian, you know, cross the board, totally for peace, and, and meets at different levels. I mean, he talks at religious levels, he talks at, at scientific levels. He's done astonishing work among scientists, you know, bringing the different views together. Incredi incredible work on a social level. It's true, isn't it? So we need some famous people. Famous people help. <laughs> Don't they? It's true, isn't it? It is you true. get a big voice, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And they like you until they don't like you. Like Obama was famous for a while, and now people don't like him and criticize him. And um, Peter, did you um, read about or hear Judge Malloy's speech last week to the Chamber of Commerce about 
the prison issue that Member Rubino is referring to, and so much of our population in prison. And basically, he was talking about how the, he has to treat somebody who, who um, I mean, the, the example he cited was like, he has to sentence somebody who has visited a child pornography site on um, the internet the same length of time in prison as somebody, a uh, father who's actually like producing child pornography with his children, you know? Yeah. I mean, he's like, this is ridiculous. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, like the activism of the churches on the death penalty issue, which to me seems almost more like a, of a moral issue as opposed to a more moral issue than social justice issue. Whereas using our prisons to warehouse you know, poor people basically um, seems much more like a social justice issue, you know, than a moral issue. I mean, I realize they're both. And I'm, in, are the churches also working on that aspect? I'm just curious, like the the comparison of those two, as far as the the attitude of the churches coming together on on uh, prison issues. Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, say that there's a. Uh, a willingness to work on something like capital punishment, but an unwillingness to deal with prison reform. You know, what we're doing in America with, you know, if the, the number one growth industry, I guess, in America is, yeah. is you know, building prisons and, you know, it, you know, communities of faith have to be involved in that. You know, the, the notion that, um, that we are warehousing people that, you know, the color of your skin has a lot to do with if you're going to be in jail or not. Um, yeah, we have to do that. We have to do that. But one of the problems is when you start talking about that, when you really confront the forces of fear, which I think is what's creating this mm -hmm. enormous industry mm -hmm. of incarceration, mm -hmm. um, when you confront the <coughs> The forces of fear. Um, it's very easy to be silenced. Of course, it is. Yeah. You know, fear is, you know, right up there with powerful human emotion. And, you know, if you uh, uh, want to possess a lot of power quickly, find ways to make people afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so what's the counterbalance to to fear? Wait, why doesn't that work with global warming? <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, you have another, you know, a, 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 a perhaps a, a different voice that's creating fear in a different way. Yeah. You know, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the power of denial is bigger than the, <laughs> the power of fear. I don't know. But no, I think it's a it's a critical issue that 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 churches need to be involved in, you know, but I'd also go back to the to the Merton quote that talks about the idolatry of trying to do, you know, all of these issues all at once, you know, that that can be a form of violence within ourselves too. I know for me that, you know, that's, few things are more paralyzing than, um, you know, you can juggle balls for a certain amount of time, but there's a point at which they all fall and you're not really excited to, to pick them up again. And, you know, how can we have those two wings? You know, that there's that lovely, lovely, very simple rhythm that gets talked about a lot when it comes to liberation theology, a Christian, you know, this theology that came up from, from South America that deals with marginalized people. They always said, oh, you have to um, engage this circle of reflection and action. So you reflect right. deeply, and then you, you know, you engage, and then you reflect, and then you engage. I don't know in the West if we do a very good job of engagement or of reflection. Well, that's the wisdom and compassion. That's the wisdom wing. The one I'm calling yeah. the wisdom wing is that one. Yeah. If you don't do it on the inside, it's not, it'll come out wrong on the outside. Yeah, it's guaranteed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The prison one. I don't know where to begin with that. I can't imagine. I mean, the work I was doing in prison. It was really clear that what we were trying to do was help individual human beings deal with being in prison. If we started getting to the point where we tried to start fighting for their rights, we would have just been drowned in, 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 in nothing would have happened. We had to really focus on what we were doing, providing materials and, and moral support and advice, spiritual advice to individuals that make them, you know, almost changing things from the inside, you know. 
and absolutely could not afford to get involved in anything else. It would have been completely insane. It would have been insurmountable. One of the things I found, because I've got kind of a, a direct and rather rude um, manner, I had to be so careful in prison, just speak slightly too loudly or sound a bit sort of arrogant because I've got an English sounding accent which can sound arrogant to people. I mean, I just would just, I can't describe, I had to be so careful and so humble and thank everybody and God bless you to every single person and thank the guards and bend over double and thank you, thank you, because it would be easily seen as a troublemaker, you know. <laughs> Actually, I got in trouble. I did get in trouble once. Shall I tell you a story how I got yeah. in trouble once in prison? Well, you're not, when you go to visit people, it's incredibly strict. You go through all the security, and in certain some of the prisons, you're not, your ladies are not even allowed to have wire into their bras, you know. And so one time I forgot that you weren't have this, and they go to all these series, you have to go on a bus, and you get somewhere, then they check. So you've got to go back to the car, they give you a, a stapler remover, so you take the wire out, and you're not allowed to not have a bra. This is a prison, madam. I mean, even though I'm sort of 110, but they didn't mind that. So I had to go go to the car, then I missed the bus, and the time is running out, and the guys are waiting, I'm so anxious. It's a three hours drive, and there's so many obstacles to get to where you have to be so I get into the line again and this time I get to almost get to the door there's 50 people lining up and it's nearly always women visiting it's very rarely men you know and you're incredibly polite to the guards you can't afford not to be and I, and I took you take I took the things out of my pocket and put them in the final little uh, security thing and I forgot I had a five dollar note and you're not allowed to have five dollar notes you can have dollar notes you can have up to, up to 30 of them to put in the machines while you're visiting somebody for the food you know and I forgot I had this five dollar note and I was, and, I, and they said, take that and go back and put it in the car, which meant another bus drive back. And I said, no, I please, I beg you. I said, can I put it over there? You keep it for me. No, you can't do that. I said, can you put it? I'll put it here. And every everywhere I turned, and I was, and then I decided I just about was going to eat it, swallow it. Nothing could have happened then. And then I saw a tissue on the ground, and I, I thought, okay, and I tore it up. And I threw it on the ground. I said, look, it's trash. <laughs> and she said, that's a felony, madam. <laughs> so I remember then I kind of completely lost. I lost it. The, the wicked person in me came out. And I started be, being, I said, you Americans are pathetic. I'm being so rude. And I've got an American passport, by the way. But I didn't sound like an American. And I could not believe it. And I thought she would just give up on it, you know. But they ended up taking me out, putting me in the bus, sending me back. And then a, the bus driver got mad at me. And then they suspended me for three months. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to be so careful, I tell you. And then I had to write terribly apologetic letters to everybody. But easily you could lose, if you lose the plot, you're finished, completely finished. It was the only time ever in 15 years. <laughs> My $5 bill. I wonder what would have happened if I'd swallowed it. That's a felony, isn't it? That could be a felony. That's a felony, yeah. probably. <laughs> anyway, what else, people? Anybody else got something to say? R yes. Rubini, could you, could you speak to the differences of sanity and insanity Good in, Lord. in the human being? <laughs> because we're, 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 we're trying to solve problems. There's so many problems in the world. Solve. You're saying if, you're, if you don't have it together inwardly, it's yes. going to come out sideways. That's right. So we've got a bunch of outside sideways problems. Yes. That's very problem. outside. Very, so, it's true. In order for it not to come outside, I think the key is to is to inside. is to is to be flexible in. Well, the way they talk about it in Buddhism is having don't have too much neurotic attachment, because when attachment doesn't get what it wants, that's what anger is. So this is the way the Buddhists would say it. So if you've got, you can be very noble and want to change the world. And this is what I remember when I was an old radical lefty demonstrating and trying to change the world. The nobility of me, the the altruism was definitely there, but I have bucket loads of attachment to my view. So the moment I met people who didn't agree with it, that's when the trouble started, angry and la shouting and yelling and arrogant. And that's, the that's what was destructive. So having a view, being clear what you're trying to try and achieve, but the flexibility so you don't lose your own mind, so you don't get out of control when things don't go the way you want them, because they probably won't go the way you want them. So you've got to have a lot of flexibility, I'd say, and a lot of patience. But patience meaning kind of courage to face the obstacles, not sort of suppressed anger kind of patience. Patience in, and perseverance, never giving up. That, I think. And that can only come if you work on yourself. I mean, there's no way I was capable of that when I was in my 20s. It was only since I became a Buddhist and was using my spiritual tools that it's given me some internal kind of sanity, you know. So that just can't come overnight. You've got to find your own methods. It doesn't seem to be a very, very popular thing to do. <laughs> What's that? Doing, working on your own mind? Doing with your own... Stuff. No, it's not, because it's easy. easy. We, we love to look at the outside world. Sometimes we, we like many people even, it seems to me, who have a real compassion uh, attitude, 
oh yes all the suffering is out there oh but I'm not suffering but they can't handle their own stress and then they end up having mental breakdowns or burning out it's the same type of thing I think we've got to see we've got stuff inside that we've got to deal with it's easy to, to, to romanticize almost and to, and to dramatize and it's very true there is incredible suffering in the world but if we're not equipped as a tool to, to handle it we will give up we will give up or we will do it wrongly so we, we've just got to it's, we've got to make the tool a better tool using whatever methods we can. And sometimes that's really hard because you just, you've got to be very humble to do that, that's like really you were yeah. saying. I, I have a dear friend who, um, a pastor, and she, um, you know, has been a social justice activist her whole life. And she oftentimes um, uh, talks about the most powerful prayer she's ever uh, heard, and she uses it a lot in her own life, in terms of when you're dealing with folks that you don't agree with. The prayer is, dear God, bless them, change me. And so to live, to live in that way where you refuse to put on the, the crown of righteousness all the time, where you refuse to put yourself in an oppositional corner, mm. where you're opening yourself up to the ability to to self-criticize, which very few people are willing to do. But I think that's one of the great gifts of faith, because I think all faith traditions on some level are inviting us into you know, that place of compassion, that place of humility, that place of non-arrogance, that place of the active love of your enemy. You know, love of enemy is a horrible thing to have to try to do. Mm -hmm. You know, because we never can completely do it. Uh, but especially it's, if it's your, especially if it's yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oftentimes we do. We have self-loathing. I mean, go to any prison. I think there's a lot of that. That's right. How do you get people to? You know, how can you embrace the enemy within yourself That's right. sure, sure. and love it? That's crucial. Yeah. But the one of the things I found, certainly working with people in prison, because of the obstacles of prisons, the, the bureaucracy was just beyond what well, you can imagine, just immense, all in the name of security, that it, it's, it's actually counterproductive. When we can start to realize that your own, your, your own neuroses and your own stubbornness and your own arrogance are just totally counterproductive and you will not get what you want to achieve. So as a tool to get exactly what you want, you've got to be infinitely flexible, infinitely capable of, it's like almost you've got to seduce everybody to do what you want, you know, which means being kind to people. You understand what I'm saying? I don't mean it in a negative sense. If, you know, if you're going to start arguing and standing on your high horse, forget it. You won't get you. you won't get what you want. So it's to, to, our own, to our own advantage. And this is something even from the Buddhist point of view, as working on yourself, when you start to realize that your anger and your depression and your arrogance destroy you, then then you can really start to change. Forget about any righteous reason for trying to change. What do you mean I'm supposed to not be angry? Just see how it hurts you. I think it's a very practical thing. But that reminds me, actually, of my friends again in Kentucky. One of Mitch, the Buddhist guy, Leaf is the Catholic. They told me about this old Catholic guy who used to come visit them, who 30 years before, his own daughter had been murdered. And, and he was, of course, full of grief and full of rage. And he said it, he went finally back to church and he said it took him 30 years to realize that the real reason he was suffering wasn't the death of his daughter, it was his own rage. So I think that's something really when you want to be, when you want to be productive, you want to be a benefit to the outside world. It's, it, you can't avoid changing yourself, but to see it as a practical issue, not some noble thing, oh, I shouldn't be angry for some high reason, just because it's destroying you, my dear, and it won't help you get what you want. It's practical, actually. But it's a tough one. Yeah. Not easy. Well, I find this uh, image, I think I might have talked about when we were together last summer, the, um, I, I just find it so intriguing that I always try to remember, sometimes it's just called the third way, sometimes it's called Jesus' third way, it can be called a lot of things, but the, the, the ways of the world, the first two ways of the world are to either fight or to flee. We all do that in our own ways. The third way is that nonviolent embrace of your enemy, who might be yourself or could be someone outside of you. But how how can we develop spiritual disciplines whereby we're living out that third way as much as we possibly can? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I, the key to that as well, I think the key to that is this one, that when I can see that my anger and my arrogance harms me, and I look at somebody else, 
that's what's harming them. Then you can afford to have compassion. If you can't deal with your own, you can't deal with somebody else's. It is literally impossible. But when I know it's harming me, my anger, I can see the other person out there harming others, it's harming them. Then I think that's, that's a basis for compassion. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, and it goes back kind of to the golden rules too. You know? What golden rule is that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah, remember. It's been said in, in every tradition in different ways. You know, uh, do unto others what you. Oh, that one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that one, that's right. John. <laughs> I've heard it said, and you mentioned the word suffering, that, that a Buddhist way of looking at the world is all life is suffering or all life involves suffering. Uh -huh. It, it seems like that could be seen as a downer, like you uh, just look around and see suffering so, everywhere. Yes. It could be sort of depressing. So, and so I wonder where the, what the role of hope or how a view of hope is Absolutely. related to social yeah. justice. Well, the context, okay, in, rel in relation to social justice. Okay, well, the, con the broader context of the spiritual sense in Buddhism is Buddha's um, assertion that every living being has this innate potential to develop to a stunning degree, they'd say to be enlightened. So meaning highly developed spiritually, meaning rid of all the neuroses and the ego voices and full of compassion and wisdom. That's really Buddha's fundamental starting point. So that with us as a starting point, then you have this then you have this wish to look inside yourself to discover what it is that's preventing you from being this, and that's all the neuroses and the misery and the voices of ego, which from the Buddhist point of view are the source of my suffering and the, the reason why I harm others. So that's why the first stages of practice are all learning about what suffering is and what it, what it, what causes it. So if you stay stuck in that you can get a bit depressed yes but the reference point for it is so that you can go beyond it and as long as you keep that in mind in your own personal practice and knowing that everybody else who's caught up in suffering they've got the potential to be free of it then it gives you courage and enthusiasm and optimism is that where the hope is the absolutely no that's the point absolutely if you lose sight of that then you drown in your misery it so can easy so it's a very hopeful oh fundamentally the point buddha's point is every living being has this infinite potential and this is what causes one to never give up on oneself but also what causes you to never give up on helping others yeah absolutely so the, the, it is hopeful but it's often not it can easily be not heard that way of course that is that's the reference point this potential that every living being has yeah and that's something i can see too that um uh Without that kind of optimism, like working within the prisons, they were just nightmares, you know. I mean, they were just horrible, evil, ghastly, awful places. But I could never afford to be arrogant and criticise anybody because anybody working there who's a guard and who's got arrogance and hates their prisoners, then they're suffering too. So the, for me, I'm not being patronising. But there was no, luckily for me, it was I was able to keep strong and optimistic in doing the work and be able to have some kind of compassion at the same time be very clear in getting the goals that I wanted achieved, you know, not being sentimental about it. And realising there was, if, if I was going to give up, then I'd just drag everybody with me. <coughs> There's no benefit, you know. So you have to have some optimism. And that, I think, has to come from your own, I'm not trying to say I'm so developed, but unless you've got some optimism in yourself about your own potential, you can't sustain it in the world because the world is such, it is a suffering place. And you hear the commonest thing among people, even who are just do nurses, if just people helping dying people, helping sick people, people burn out. One of the commonest things you hear is you burn out because we haven't learned the tools to really take care of ourselves. And so this analogy of the wisdom wing and the compassion wing, the Dalai Lama often says compassion is not enough, you need wisdom. It gives you kind of strength. It gives, wisdom gives kind of iron to the compassion. So you persevere and you stay stable and you stay optimistic. Or kind of like I say, I like to say it, you stay perky. Might as well stay perky, you know. Even if you're drowning, you might as well be perky. <laughs> you understand? And that, that's, that's got to come, you can't just, you can't force that, you know. You've got to work on that one. Please. Yeah. There's a, say, uh, a saying that um, I read, and it uh, goes like this. You've mastered your life when things on the outside are less important than what's on the inside. And I think, for me, in this uh, social justice that you're talking about, is for me to recognize who I am, and that in that way I recognize who everybody else is. Uh -huh. You know, and I'm not taking away from what you're doing, like for the prison people uh -huh. that are suffering, uh -huh. and for the poor people that are suffering, and for people that are with AIDS. But for me. I need to recognize who my true self. Yes. And 
and that way I can be I can have the compassion for everybody. Absolutely. The world. Absolutely. And, um, no, absolutely. I think I totally. Think that's yep. what we need to recognize. Uh -huh. You know, and that should become our job. Uh -huh. You know, as you got your job, uh -huh. because you're in a position to do what you do best. You know, and um, but we need to recognize who we truly are and to live that way. Absolutely. I think it's another way of, I think it's a perfect way of saying what I've been saying here, kind of working on yourself and developing this wisdom wing, that you, you just said it in that way and I think it sounds perfect. I think you can't, it's got to be this one. I think it's, I think it's a perfect way to put it. Thank you very much. Perfect. I was, uh, you know, we do this thing called confirmation for our young people. It's kind of a rite of passage moving from childhood to adulthood. and. Um, I've been using this image that uh, apparently comes out of Australia, out of uh -huh. uh, um, Aboriginal culture when they make that movement with boys in particular uh -huh. from boyhood to manhood and they say that they have to teach them four things. And I think it has to do with what you're talking uh -huh. about in terms of suffering and in terms of knowing yourself. They uh -huh. said in order to become a, a mature human being you have to know that life is hard. You have to know that you're not in control. You have to know that you're going to die. And you have to know that your life is not about you. And of course, it's that fourth one that is so incredibly countercultural to the time and place in which we live. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's no wonder that we have such a hard time with notions of, of unity because we're so separated mm -hmm. and, and we tend to worship ourselves. Um, but having a, a counter narrative that says, oh, you know, your life really isn't about you. You know, your life is about something much larger than that. It's about the power of love. It's, it's about being connected to each other mm -hmm. and that it goes on beyond us. Um, and I suppose what that gentleman's saying is when you know who you really are, then you can know that. Then you can. So only you can know it then. Yeah. You when can you be know liberated you. from that's your right. own self. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Totally true. I agree. Which, I mean, it's, that's about social justice, too. Surely. What other questions do you all have? I, going back to one of your first questions, you were talking about um, what prevents us from social justice. and. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind was fear. Uh -huh. And then I've been thinking a lot this evening about how um, on the last 60 or 70 years, we've seen so many advances in telecommunications and transportation, <coughs> cyberspace, that what used to be a community was something that was much more local. It's true. And now it's enormous. No, it's true, isn't it? And that, that has so many um, dangers and so many opportunities. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. when you're talking, for example, about the Dalai Lama, you know, being driven from his country and mm -hmm. the state of Tibetan Buddhist now, but now he's this, this voice that's, that's right. that everybody hears. That's right. You know, it's true. And I don't really know what my question is, but <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I, I keep sort of thinking about this, no, um, no. the way this cuts through time as well, and how much um, our sense of community and who we serve has changed mm -hmm. in the last 70, 80 years, and that that I think is sometimes fearful. Mm -hmm. And I think our media. Uh, keeps us in fear instead of showing mm -hmm. us, you know, the connections we have. A lot of times we're shown what we should be afraid of. Yeah, yeah. I, and I yeah, think you're totally thing. right. I mean, fear mm -hmm. is, you know, sometimes people say that, um, you know, this century is the century of anxiety and fear. It's you know, true. that we're it's governed true. by that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as people of faith, we have to give an alternative to fear. And um, you know, we have to have a good sense of what it is that we're fearful of. Because yeah. as long as you're really fearful, you really can't be all that free. And, and I look at this time and place we live in, I mean, it, it's a very fearful time, but it's also a time when some remarkable changes are going on. You know, I look at, um, you know, the circumstances in my life have been such that I've been particularly involved in human rights issues for gay and lesbian folk. 
um, you know, we ain't where we want to be, but we ain't where we were with that. And, you know, we need to be thankful for that. And we need to understand that the forces of fear have been confronted and that there has been some remarkable changes mm -hmm. that have gone on. Um, and, and we need to have a heart of, of, of thanksgiving for that, too. That can counterbalance our fears. Well, I think sometimes the speed at which that happens, we forget to oh. to look at that, you yeah. know, at the opportunities and the um, successes yeah. that have come and the broadening of, you know, <coughs> who is my community that I'm serving? Who, you know, yeah. What are the connections? I think your point before about um, remembering it, one of the four points, maybe, maybe you're going to die. That's a really very interesting it's one. It's not maybe. It's, what? Yeah, it's not that maybe. You're gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> that you're going to die. That, um, I know certainly for the Buddhist ones, one of the main practices is getting in touch with the reality of impermanence, especially death. Not to make you depressed, but to energize you to not waste life. And so, so what I'm saying is, what, just recently, I was mentioning it at the centre this week, I uh, saw some one Australian nurse who'd been involved with dying people. She did some research among the dying people, the five main points that was most common. And the top point was that people died with the deepest, had the regret that they hadn't followed their own hearts, hadn't been afraid of doing what they really wanted to do rather than doing what they think other people expected them to do. And I know in Buddhist psychology they talk very much about one of our deepest attachments, our neurotic attachments, is to, is to what we think other people think of us. And so therefore get stuck and don't, don't follow what we truly wish. I think that's a massive fear. And so thinking about death, I remember reading, about reading Steve Jobs, you know, when he realised he was going to die. It, he said it was transformative because he realised there was nothing to lose. Nothing to lose, you know. Yeah. So I think that's a massive point. At the most basic level, our fears of what other people think. Mm -hmm. Terrified of moving in case someone criticises us because we're craving so badly for this. Yeah. I think that's one of our worst ones. The most basic level. I was raised Catholic, and I remember hearing so often. And me too. Suffer in this life, be rewarded in the next, which I think is not only a Catholic, uh -huh. but not it's only Christian. A Christian. Thing. Sure. And and I was just thinking that it would have been helpful if uh, if God had inspired the Bible w words to say that when you get to heaven, the heaven you're going to find is the heaven or hell you made for yourself here on this earth, as opposed to suffering here to be rewarded there. So if you suffer through this, heaven is going to be suffering. Mm -hmm. How do you mean? Like not losing of, you a bit. Can you say well, that again? A lot of our society, <laughs> I think, put up with stuff or suffer through things or look for the reward or try and follow the rules so that oh, I see. Reward. It's yes. an afterlife or a next or a later or the future mm. is going to be the reward. And even in Islam, the 70 virgins or whatever, that oh. comes about and everything. Mm. And it, it seems like religion doesn't always act as a very good corrective to focus back that this is where we make our heaven or hell oh, for I ourselves see. and yes, one yes. another. Right. I think Buddhism in a sense tries to focus that better than Christianity sometimes succeeds. Mm. Interesting point. Okay. The, yeah, sometimes it's called requirement reward religion, you know, which is very transactional, you know. If you fulfill this requirement, you get this reward. Da, 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 da. As opposed to a more transformational approach, which, you know, would have Jesus saying, you know, th the kingdom of God is here. And to hear that in a really different way, it says, oh, it is here. It's here now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody else. Go on. I have something about Buddhism, which yes. is I, 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 I um, and that is what what words would you use to talk about the condition of gratitude? Or is that the is that the very word you would use to describe? Absolutely. Oh gosh, yes. Um, <laughs> I do just say something ruder than gosh. I don't know why I said gosh. Um, yeah, Grat gratitude would well. It's, yeah. How would we use that word? So for, may I ask you how you'd use it, first of all, well, so I can I, get a reference? I use it to make myself feel better. <laughs> so gratitude to who? For, for something or other. Not gratitude I to... I woke up or I slept all night or it's sun shining or it's raining. So you're grateful to somebody or you're just grateful in general? Oh, in general. Oh, okay, now I get your point. 
Oh, absolutely. This comes, we would call it rejoicing. You know, that you, you, you delight in your own good qualities. You delight in your effort. You delight in the qualities of others. You delight when things are going well. There's all sorts of reasons in Buddhist philosophy for this, but that's a huge point. And one of the, the antidotes to always being miserable and always finding your own faults and always criticizing yourself and always seeing the glass half full, there's no question, yes, that's the perky business. Definitely. <laughs> yes, definitely. A big one. Very important. And, you know, I think a lot of religious traditions, too, talk about the difference between happiness and, and sort of a prevailing joy, a prevailing gratitude for, the, you know, not, not that the conditions of life have met your approval, but rather that the presence of life itself is great gift. And we're called to live out of a deep sense of gratitude, which is not a privatistic notion. You know, and I think then it becomes more of a social justice issue too. Because if we deny that to one, we deny it to all of us. And we What do you mean? You're losing me a bit. Well that's my if, mistake, not if, yours. If we yeah, that's right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, if we Say deny mean. I mean, you know, a right denied to one is a right denied to all. If we um, <coughs> um, are not able to inspire a sense of joy and and gratitude to other people for their very lives um, were diminishing them and we're diminishing ourselves. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. I see, Jane. And I suppose I could say that to that one, thinking again about my friends in prison, which where ideally speaking you'd think, well you wouldn't want to live there, you know, give me the key, I want to get the hell out, right, because they're not pleasant places. But what I found among many, again, many of the people that I knew in prison who might be on death row or didn't, who had a life sentence, and it was, must have been so tough because they were really garbage dumps, really finding the way, working on themselves and practicing their paths, finding a way to even be content with that and joyful with what they have got even. I mean, that's, that really needs courage, I think, because it's so easy to see how things can be better, you know. But to know that if you can't, one of the ways they say in Buddhism, which is a bit scary, if you can change something, Buddha says, no problem, please change it. But if you can't, why worry? Mm. And that can be that that easily can sound like being passive, but it's being very realistic. Like the prisoners, especially, they, they know that's a fact. You can't, they cannot open those doors. So you can sit there and be depressed for fifty years, or you can make the most of it. And that's a really tough one. But it's marvelous when you see people who can do that yeah. and see the best of it. Well, and, and delight and, and have joy. And you brought up the the the, the reality of the freedom for for some people, at least, who are in the process of actively dying. You know, yes. They've never felt as alive. There's a certain freedom right. in the midst of that very there obvious captivity That's that right. most of us would judge. And mm -hmm. Jan does hospice work, and you probably see that a lot. Absolutely. Know? No, no, that's true. Yes. But not all the time. <laughs> Is that enough? Are we done enough? <laughs> we done enough damage? For Have we one done one? enough damage? Yeah. For one <laughs> I don't know. Many would say we have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you for coming out. You, you've all uh, borne witness to justice today, knowingly or not. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you. Give him a kiss. <laughs> <laughs>